Now this is an interesting topic. For those unfamiliar with Ganesh's claim here, it essentially goes like this. It starts with two assertions. The first is that Joseph Smith is the author of the Book of Mormon. And in fact, he's the sole author, meaning that Oliver Cowdery, who Joseph is dictating his text to, is truly serving only as Joseph's scribe and not co-conspiring in the production of the text. And the second is that Joseph is simply making this up as he goes along. Sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way, like an improv conversation, an improvisation. So for those that subscribe to this theory, they often point to Jacob 5 as evidence. And that's because Joseph appears to make a critical mistake when composing what is known as the allegory of the olive tree. So here's what purportedly happened. While dictating the text to Oliver Cowdery, Joseph decides he wants to flex his literary muscles and gives an account of an olive tree. And he does this by somewhat awkwardly mishmashing elements together from two different biblical passages. Namely, seven verses from Isaiah, known as the Song of the Vineyard, and nine verses from Paul's epistle to the Romans. So he begins by pulling from Paul's passage, which refers to a metaphorical olive tree that has natural branches cut off and wild branches grafted in. In Paul's case, he's referring to the Romans and how they're being grafted into the house of Israel through their conversion to Christianity. So I think it's worth noting that Joseph's allegory is a bit more complex and significantly longer. In fact, the Book of Mormon's olive tree allegory is nearly 10 times longer than the longest parable in Christian scripture. So kudos to him on that. But then, according to the critical narrative, Joseph seems to get confused when he begins mixing in elements from Isaiah 5 and referring to the vineyard as the focal point of the allegory rather than the olive tree. And we're left with this rather odd depiction of a vineyard of olive trees, which makes absolutely no sense. Now, I think this is an excellent example of why our approach to the Book of Mormon matters. And I'm going to draw from a literary example to make my point. The following is a grammatically correct sentence. The old man, the boat. That's it. That's the whole sentence. You're probably confused. And you should be. This is an example of what is called a garden path sentence. And what makes it unique is its tendency to cause confusion when left in isolation. But it becomes a completely logical statement if you give just a bit of context. Aboard the ship, everybody has their responsibilities. The young make the food, and the old man the boat. Similarly, when we strip Book of Mormon characters of their unique voice, context, and perspective, and mentally replace them with 23-year-old Joseph, we're forcing a narrative onto the text that renders a rather disjointed and nonsensical revision of the story. And it naturally causes confusion, and ultimately gets us nowhere closer to better understanding the text. And in my opinion, this is exactly what's happening in the Jacob 5 theory. So right off the bat, the assertion that Joseph is getting confused between the olive tree and the vineyard makes no sense to me. In the very first sentence of the allegory, the author clearly places a tame olive tree on the grounds of a vineyard, and in fact reiterates the setting 90 times in its 77 verse passage. This clearly was not done by accident, to the point that I'm not even sure it's possible to have read this allegory and come to that conclusion. But I'd also like to push back on the apologetics argument on this detail. You see, in the 1990s, there was an argument put out that a vineyard doesn't always actually mean a vineyard. You can read more about it right here. Now, I personally don't subscribe to this idea. It doesn't make sense to me. If it's not an actual vineyard, Joseph should have rendered a different word, such as garden or a grove. But according to the text, the author of Jacob 5 is clearly and intentionally depicting an olive tree in a vineyard. The next detail that strains credulity is the assertion that Joseph was perhaps confused or unaware of what a group of olive trees is called. So rather than referring to an olive orchard or a grove of olive trees, he makes the mistake of labeling it a vineyard. And here's where I'd push back. We're talking about a 23-year-old farm boy in upstate New York. At this point, Joseph has worked in orchards most of his life, and he quite literally refers to the woods near his home as a grove of trees. And the final assertion requires us to again believe that Joseph is scavenging over biblical texts in order to pluck out the smallest detail that he can incorporate into his dictated account, such as having the tree cumber the ground or the concept of digging and dunging around a tree, or the idea of casting unfruitful branches into the fire. It's this dogmatic idea that led one prominent critic to conclude that Joseph may in fact be history's greatest eclectic aggregator known to man. Yikes. So I would submit that rather than forcing this narrative, which requires us to ignore evidence to the contrary and attribute genius status to a lowly farm boy, a better approach would be to study the text a little more carefully. For starters, Alessandro is confused why a new world prophet is relating an allegory centered on old world imagery. But if we take the time to actually read the text in question, we find that in the very first verse of the passage, Jacob is actually pulling his account from an ancient Hebrew text. But it goes even further than that. Jacob attributes the entire allegory to an old world prophet named Zenos, a purported contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. 
In its context, this makes sense and explains his intentional allusion to Isaiah's writings. However, there are also very distinct differences between these two passages. In Isaiah's account, he attributes the whole vineyard to only represent the house of Judah. Zena's account expands this narrative by placing an olive tree in the vineyard. But in this case, the olive tree represents the whole house of Israel, and the vineyard now represents the broader world. Now it's made explicitly clear that Zenus is admonishing the Israelites when he relates this allegory. So his focus is primarily on the nature and fate of the olive tree. And in the account, the Lord of the vineyard tends to the tree by pruning it, planting its branches in other parts of the vineyard, and grafting in branches from wild trees. Now the Book of Mormon places Zenus in the old world prior to the Babylonian exile, which would explain his use of an olive tree to represent the house of Israel as similar if not identical imagery is used throughout the Hebrew Bible, as opposed to something more contemporary to Joseph's world, such as an apple orchard or a harvesting a field of potatoes. And while we're on the topic, Zenus is referred to in the Book of Mormon across five different texts, and yet his character remains consistent and his focus on the gathering of Israel. It's basically his equivalent to airplanes in Uchtdorf. So it begs the question, what is an olive tree doing in a vineyard? Well, it turns out that the author of Jacob 5 did their homework. Because not only are the fruit of the olive tree and the vineyard central commodities in the ancient Israelite world, but the actual detail of planting their olive trees in their vineyards was a common practice. Now you wouldn't know this if your only source text was a King James Bible, but this is now a historically attested old world custom. And it rather specifically pertains to these two floras, the vine and the olive tree. So not only is this allegory drawing from sacred Israelite symbolism by grouping two of the most valued fruits of the old world, it's deploying agricultural imagery and pulling from prominent customs and traditions of its ancient audience. And the fact that the author of Jacob 5 takes for granted that this would not be common knowledge to a modern reader adds to that feeling of authenticity to Joseph's framework. And as to the notion that Joseph is simply feeling around in the dark as he dictates this fabricated text to Oliver, I'd personally challenge you to read the passage that precedes the allegory because it offers a rather important preface to the message. In fact, in its original publication, Jacob 4 and Jacob 5 were together in a single chapter. So if you read Jacob 4, it is made very clear the rhetorical goal of this author in relating the allegory in Jacob 5 and expounding on it in Jacob 6. And the author does this by drawing from ancient scripture. In the span of a single verse, Jacob refers to the stumbling of the Jews, rejecting the stone upon which they might build that would become the sure foundation of their ultimate redemption all very intentional allusions to old world literature that an ancient audience would easily recognize. To simply assert that Joseph can seamlessly refer to three different Israelite passages in a single sentence and then somehow get completely lost in his own allegory on the very next page, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and feels more like we're forcing a narrative rather than following the story. And from a literary perspective, this is where Jacob's passage truly shines. Not only does this literature naturally fit within the Nephite text, this allegory found in the Book of Mormon effectively contextualizes Paul's epistle to the Romans. Meaning that if you were to read Jacob 5 and then read Romans 11, you actually have a better grasp at comprehending Paul's imagery. It enriches the reader's understanding of Israelite covenant theology through symbolism that is more relevant to an ancient audience than to that of a modern reader. Now, does any of this prove that the Book of Mormon is a historical text? Of course not but it does offer yet another important detail to the authorial profile of the Book of Mormon. Whoever authored this text was familiar with the ancient world and is comfortable with expounding on the words and writings of Isaiah and is capable of comprehending and producing extended allegory with rich theological depth. And that's really what I'm trying to demonstrate here because the dominant critical narrative is ironically rather uncritical of its own claims. And I think Jacob 5 serves as a good example of that because for whatever reason, we take issue with an olive tree in an orchard in Jacob 5 while willfully ignoring old world passages like this one. It just doesn't add up. It's time we come to recognize that this is a poor approach to the text and that this record has more depth and complexity to it than previously thought.